Hello everyone, from Oberwolfach in Germany, which is a fantastic research institute in mathematics. So I wanted to show you around, but it's actually dark outside, so I don't think you would see very much, unfortunately. All right, so what we're going to do in this video is study how we can calculate the average value of a function using integration. And we're also going to see the related result, which is really cool, uh, called the mean value theorem for definite integrals. So let me start with a motivational example. Suppose that you're moving with a certain velocity function, say v of t is equal to 1 minus e to the minus t, and then you start at t equals to 0. What is your average velocity after 5 seconds? That's a good question. So let's try to calculate that. So the velocity function here, if you sketch the graph, will look like something like this. Now t equals to 5 is here. I could certainly calculate the instantaneous velocity at t equals to 5 just by substituting t equals 5 in my expression. What I want is the average velocity between t equals 0 and t equals to 5. But I certainly know how to calculate that. The average velocity will be given by the distance that I've covered over these 5 seconds divided by the time interval, which will be just 5 seconds in this case. All right, and I actually also know how to calculate the distance because the distance, if you know the velocity function, the distance is given by the area under the curve, right? So I could rewrite that as being the integral between 0 and 5 of my velocity function. That gives me the distance that I've covered, divided by the time interval, which in this case is just 5 minus 0. Okay, and now I can just plug in the velocity function and calculate what I get. So I get 1 over 5 integral 0 to 5, 1 minus e to the minus t dt which I can certainly integrate. I get 1 over 5, integral of 1 is t, integral of minus e to the minus t is just going to be plus e to the minus t between 0 and 5. Plugging in the numbers, I get 5 plus e to the minus 5 minus 0 minus 1, which gives me 1 over 5 times 4 plus e to the minus 5. Now this is the average velocity over these 5 seconds. You see this is, just a, this is just a number, it's not a function anymore. This is really the average velocity over this particular time interval. Okay, so this was pretty easy, but what we've done here is completely general. So let's try to summarize what we've done. So in general, the average value of a continuous function f over an interval a to b is always given by the exact same expression that we use, namely 1 over b minus a, this was the time interval, times the integral between a and b of f of x dx, this was uh, what I call the distance covered in the case where we had the velocity function here. This is how we define the average val value of a continuous function. Okay, so what I want to do now is give you a sketch of a proof of why this is the average value of a continuous function. So let's get started. So suppose that I have some arbitrary function y equals f of x here between two points a and b here. Okay, and then I want to calculate the average value of my function over this interval. So the idea here is to do exactly the same as we've done for all applications of integrations. We want to slice the problem. So what I'm going to do here is basically uh, divide the domain, so divide the interval between a and b into n little uh, subintervals, all of the same width. So the width will be delta x, which is b minus a, the total length of the interval, divided by the number of subintervals. So what I'm doing here in the picture is I'm dividing this into something like n subintervals like this. All right, so here I'm going to call this point here x1, x2, and so on. All the way this will be x n minus 1 and the end point here will be xn. This would be x0. Okay, now I can approximate, so I can approximate, oh, not much battery, that's fine, we'll survive. I can approximate the average value f average here by taking the average value of the value of the function here at the right endpoints of my interval all the way to f to the x, f at x n, right? So I could write the approximation for my uh, average value as being f of x1 
plus so on, plus f of xn. And then, of course, I need to divide by the number of values here, which turns out to be n. OK, so that's a good approximation. In fact, I could rewrite it, can replace n here by my expression here. So n here will be equal to b minus a uh, over delta x. So in other words, I get delta x over b minus a times the sum between i equals 1 and n of f of x i, which would be a good approximation for the average value. But now to get the exact value of the average value of the function, what I want to do is send the number of intervals to go to infinity. So I want to take the limit as n goes to infinity. Right? This is always what we do. So we first get a good approximation for n some intervals, and then we take the limit n going to infinity, and that would be the actual uh, average value of the function. So here probably I should have something like, I don't know, how can I write that for the approximation? Maybe I should just write this like this. But now the actual value of the average function here will be the limit as n goes to infinity of this expression. So I'm going to rewrite it as 1 over b minus a times the sum. I'm just going to bring the delta x in there. And now if you look back at a long time ago, you will realize that if I bring that in here, the expression here is just the limit of a Riemann sum, which becomes a definite integral, and I end up with the statement that the average value will be 1 over b minus a times the definite integral between a and b of the function f of x dx, which is exactly the formula that I have here. Okay, so what I want to do now is look more closely at the geometric meaning of the average value of a function. Okay, so suppose that I have a function, something like that, between two point A and B, then its average value will be somewhere between, I don't know, something like this maybe. This would be F average if my blue line here is the function Y equals F of X. F average will be given by 1 over B minus A times the integral between A and B of F of X dx. Okay, but what does it mean geometrically? So one way to understand it is to multiply both sides of this equation by b minus a. So I get that b minus a times f average is equal to the integral to an a and b of f of x dx. And then I can interpret both sides geometrically. So the right hand side here, so I'm going to assume that f is a positive function in this video, but you could do the exact same uh, reasoning for arbitrary functions. So if f is positive, then the right hand side here is the area under the curve. So in my picture here, this would be something like this. But on the left-hand side here, I have a different interpretation. This is the area of a rectangle of width b minus a and height f average. Right. So in the picture here, this is this would be something like that. So the average value, another way of understanding the average value is, is, is the following. So it's uh, the average value of the function is going to be the height such that the rectangle here has the exact same area as the area under the curve of the function. So that's another way to understand the average value of a function. And it leads us to a beautiful theorem, which is the mean value theorem for definite integrals, which, as we'll see, is closely related to the mean value theorem that we've studied in the previous semester. So here's the statement of the theorem. So the mean value theorem for definite integrals is the statement that if f is a continuous function on some closed interval a to b, then there must exist a point c on, in this interval such that the value of the function at c is exactly equal to the average value of our function. And that makes sense, right? If I have a function here defined between two points a and b, then the average value will be somewhere in here, I don't know, and the statement here is, is saying that there must be a c such that the value of the function at c is exactly equal to this average value. And that makes sense as long as the function is continuous and it cannot jump over its average value. And geometrically, what the mean value theorem is saying is exactly the same thing as we saw in the previous slide. If you multiply both sides by b minus a, what it is saying is that there must exist a c such that the rectangle with width b minus a and height f of c as the exact same area as the area under the curve. There's always such a C, 
And of course, f of c here is just going to be the average value of the function. Okay, that's really cool. I don't want to apply the mean value theorem to problem solving in this video. We'll do some examples in class. What I want to do now is give you the proof of the mean value theorem, because it's pretty neat, and it relates it to the mean value theorem that we studied in the previous semester. Okay, so how can I prove this statement? So let me start by stating what the mean value theorem that we saw in the previous semester is. So the mean value theorem that we saw was the following statement. If I start with a function, say g of x, which is continuous on a to b, and we also needed to assume that it's differentiable on a to b. Then the statement of the mean value theorem was the statement that there must exist a c on this interval such that the slope of the tangent line at c, at g of c, will be exactly equal to the slope of the secant line of our function. So in other words, there must exist a c in this interval. Yes, again, the battery is low. Awesome. We'll survive. There must exist a c in this interval such that the slope of the tangent line at this point, so g prime of c, it's exactly equal to the slope of the secant line, which has the following expression. Okay, so this is what we know. How can we use that to prove the mean value theorem for definite integrals? So the idea is really cool. So what we'll do is consider the following function. I'm going to call it capital f of x, which is the integral between a, of a and x of f of t dt where f here is an arbitrary continuous function from a to b. Now first you need to check that this function f of x satisfies the assumptions of the old mean value theorem, but it turns out it does. If you assume that little f of t is continuous, then capital F of x will also be continuous and it will also be differentiable, so that's good. Now what mvt is saying, the old mvt, is saying that there is a c in our interval such that capital F prime of C will be equal to capital F of B minus capital F of A over B minus A. But then what is this? Well, I can just replace using our definition of capital F of X. This will be the integral between A and B of F of T dt minus the integral between A and A of F of T dt divided by b minus a. But then, of course, the second term here is always 0, regardless of what the function is, because I'm integrating from a to a. So I end up here with the statement that this, the right-hand side, is equal to 1 over b minus a times the integral between a and b of f of t dt, which is, of course, just the right-hand side of my statement. But what about the left-hand side? So I have capital F prime of c, but we know, so let me change color to make it clear. So let's try to evaluate the left-hand side. So we know that by the fundamental theorem of calculus, if I calculate the derivative of this function here, what will I get? I'll get d dx of the integral from a to x of f of t dt. And we all know very well by now that this will just be f, little f of x. So in other words, capital F prime of C here is really just little f of C, which was the left-hand side of the statement. Therefore, it follows that f, there must exist a C such that f of C is equal to 1 b minus a times the integral from a to b of f of t, 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 which is exactly the statement of the mean value theorem for definite integrals. So that's really cool. So the statement here, the, the lesson here of this proof is that this is not really a new theorem, it's a consequence of the old mean value theorem, but it's a new formulation, so instead of thinking in terms of secant lines and tangent lines, here we're thinking in, ter we're thinking in terms of integration, so we're thinking in terms of area under the curve and area of rectangle. But the two theorems are really the same, which is why they're both called mean value theorems.